Who is Dorothea Helen Puente? Puente was born Dorothea Helen Gray on January 9, 1929, in Redlands, California, to Trudy May, Nay Yates, and Jesse James Gray. Her parents were both alcoholics, and her father repeatedly threatened to kill himself in front of his children. Her father died of tuberculosis in 1937. Her mother, who worked as a sex worker, lost custody of her children in 1938 and died in a motorcycle accident by the end of the year. Puente and her siblings were subsequently sent to an orphanage where she was sexually abused. Gray's first marriage at age 16 in 1945 was to a soldier named Fred McFall, who had just returned from the Pacific Theater of World War II. They had two daughters between 1946 and 1948. Gray sent one child to live with relatives in Sacramento and placed the other for adoption. She also suffered a miscarriage. McFall left her in late 1948. In the spring of 1948, Gray was arrested for purchasing women's accessories using forged checks in Riverside. She pled guilty to two counts of forgery, serving four months in jail and three years probation. Six months after her release, she left Riverside. In 1952, Gray married merchant seaman Axel Bren Johansson in San Francisco. She created a fake persona, calling herself Taya Singoala Nayarda, a Muslim woman of Egyptian and Israeli descent. They had a turbulent marriage. Gray took advantage of Johansson's frequent trips to sea by inviting men to their home and gambling away his money. Gray was arrested in 1960 for owning and operating a bookkeeping firm as a front for a brothel in Sacramento. She was found guilty and was sentenced to 90 days in the Sacramento County Jail. In 1961, Johansson had Gray briefly committed to DeWitt State Hospital after a binge of drinking, lying, criminal behavior, and suicide attempts. While there, doctors diagnosed her as a pathological liar with an unstable personality. Gray and Johansson divorced in 1966 although she continued to use Johansson's name for some time following their separation. Gray assumed the identity of Sharon Johansson, hiding her delinquent behavior by portraying herself as a devout Christian woman. She established her reputation as a caregiver, providing young women with a sanctuary from poverty and abuse without charge. In 1968, Gray married Roberto Jose Puente. After 16 months, the couple separated with Gray citing domestic abuse. Gray was arrested in 1960 for owning and operating a bookkeeping firm as a front for a brothel in Sacramento. She was found guilty and was sentenced to 90 days in the Sacramento County Jail. In 1961, Johansson had Gray briefly committed to DeWitt State Hospital after a binge of drinking, lying, criminal behavior, and suicide attempts. While there, Doctors diagnosed her as a pathological liar with an unstable personality. Gray and Johansson divorced in 1966, although she continued to use Johansson's name for some time following their separation. Gray assumed the identity of Sharon Johansson, hiding her delinquent behavior by portraying herself as a devout Christian woman. She established her reputation as a caregiver providing young women with a sanctuary from poverty and abuse without charge. In 1968, Gray married Roberto Jose Puente. After 16 months, the couple separated, with Gray citing domestic abuse. In 1967, she attempted to serve him with a divorce petition, but Puente fled to Mexico. The divorce wouldn't be finalized until 1973. The two would continue to have a turbulent relationship and Gray filed a restraining order in 1975. Gray would continue to use the surname Puente for more than 20 years. Following her divorce, Puente focused on running a boarding house located near 15th and F Streets in Sacramento. She established herself as a genuine resource to the community to aid alcoholics, homeless people, and mentally ill people by holding Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and assisting individuals to sign up to receive Social Security benefits. She changed her public image
to that of a respectable older matron by putting on vintage clothing, wearing large granny glasses, and letting her hair turn gray. She also established herself as a respected member of Sacramento's Hispanic community, funding charities, scholarships, and radio programs. She eventually met and married Pedro Angel Montalvo, though Montalvo abruptly left the relationship a week after their marriage. On December 21, 1978, Dorothea Puente was convicted of illegally cashing 34 state and federal checks that belonged to her tenants. She was given five years probation and ordered to pay $4,000 in restitution. Victims On January 16, 1982, Puente picked up Malcolm McKenzie, 74, from a bar and took him back to his apartment. He reported that Puente had slipped something into his drink before robbing him of coins, watches, and other jewelry, including a diamond ring belonging to his mother, which she removed from his finger while he was incapacitated. On April 28, 1982, Ruth Monroe, 61, was found dead due to respiratory depression caused by a massive overdose of codeine. Monroe was reportedly in good health when she arrived at Puente's home just over two weeks prior to her death. However, by April 25th, she told a friend, I am so sick I feel like I am going to die. Monroe's death was originally ruled an undeterminate overdose, but later classified as a homicide. On May 16, 1982, Dorothy Osborne, 49, found checks, credit cards, and other items missing eight hours after Puente, visited her home and prepared her a drink. In June 1982, Puente was convicted of three grand theft charges. She was sentenced to five years in prison, state parole, until March 21, 1986, and her federal parole sentence was extended another two years until 1990. During her incarceration, she began corresponding with Everson Theodore Gilmouth, a 77-year-old retiree from Oregon. At the beginning of September in 1985, Gilmouth came to Sacramento with his truck and trailer and arrived at Puente's boarding house. On September 9, 1985, after serving only half her sentence, Puente was released from prison, whereupon she was picked up by Gilmouth and Ricardo Orderiza, a close friend who lived with his family in the downstairs flat at 1426 F Street. In October 1985, Puente wrote to Gilmouth's sister informing her that she and Gilmouth were to be married on November 2nd. A short time later, Puente hired a handyman, Ismael Carrasco Flores, for remodeling and asked him to build a six foot by 30 inch by 30 inch storage box. She agreed to give him Gilmouth's truck and $800 as payment. The day after he completed the box, he returned to find the box nailed shut. Puente asked Flores to help her take the box which now weighed approximately 300 pounds, to a storage location, but ended up dumping the box near a river about an hour away from Sacramento. On December 28, 1998, it was determined that Gilmouth was the previously unidentified body discovered by a fisherman alongside the Sacramento River on January 1, 1986. Gilmouth's body was wrapped in numerous plastic bags and covered with a bed sheet held in place by electrical tape. Mothballs and blue toilet deodorizer were also found inside the box. It was later discovered that after Gilmouth's death, Puente mailed fake letters and cards to his sister in an attempt to make her believe he was still alive. Puente was also found to have forged Gilmouth's signature on his truck's certificate of title and continued cashing Gilmouth's benefit checks until July of 1986. In the fall of 1986, Betty Mae Palmer, 78, arrived at Puente's boarding house. On October 14, 1986, Puente obtained a California ID card with her photo and Palmer's name. Two months later, the mailing address on Palmer's social security checks was changed to Puente's F Street address. Puente forged Palmer's signature and cashed nearly $7,000 worth of benefit checks belonging to Palmer. In November 1988, 
Palmer's partially dismembered body was discovered in a shallow hole in Puente's front yard. Her head, hands, and lower legs were never found. Toxicology reports revealed the presence of doxylamine, an over-the-counter antihistamine, as well as haloperidol and fluorazepam, both of which were previously prescribed to Palmer. She was identified on January 24, 1989, through comparison to previous medical x-rays. On October 21, 1986, Puente summoned a notary to the hospital room of Leona Carpenter, 78, following a fluorazepam overdose. She was given power of attorney over Carpenter and began cashing her social security checks just 10 days later. In December, after Carpenter was released from the hospital, she went to live with Puente. Once again, Carpenter returned to the hospital and just a few weeks after she was discharged, in February 1987, she disappeared. In November 1988, her body was found in the southeastern corner of Puente's yard. Toxicology reports of Carpenter's brain tissue revealed the presence of codeine, diazepam, and fluorazepam. In February 1988, Alvaro Bert Gonzalez Montoya, 51, arrived at Puente's home. In March, an application designating Puente as Montoya's benefits payee was filed. At the end of August, a roommate saw a man clearing Montoya's clothes out of the closet. He missed an appointment on August 29th and was last seen on August 24th. Puente told several people that Montoya went to Mexico to visit his relatives. Social workers continued to attempt to contact Montoya in September and October to no avail. In November, Puente asked Donald Anthony, a former convict who had been working in her yard, to contact the social worker, pretending to be Montoya's brother-in-law. He agreed and called stating his name was Michel Obergon and that he picked up Montoya from the F Street house and took him to Utah. The social worker was suspicious and told Puente that she was going to call the police. On November 10th, the social worker received a letter, purportedly from Michel Obergon, wrapped in a paper towel to avoid fingerprints. Days later, Montoya's body was found buried adjacent to Carpenter. Toxicology testing revealed the presence of loxapine, fluorazepam, diphenhydramine, amitriptyline, and carbamazepine. Montoya had prescriptions for all of the drugs except for carbamazepine. On March 9, 1988, Benjamin Fink, 55, was sent to live with Puente. Fink's brother visited him on a weekly basis for six weeks. By the end of April, Fink was gone. Another tenant reported smelling a foul odor emanating from his room, but was told by Puente that it was a sewer backup. On April 29th, Puente received 12 bags of cement. That June, she had a hole dug next to the door of the metal shed, which was later filled in with concrete. In November, Fink's body was discovered in this area, wrapped in plastic knotted bedspread, secured with duct tape and covered with blue absorbent pads. His toxicology report revealed the presence of amitriptyline, loxapine, and fluorazepam. Arrest and death. On November 7, 1988, police spoke with John Sharp, a former resident, about the disappearance of Montoya. Initially, Sharp told police that he had seen Montoya two days earlier, but then slipped a note to the officer that said, she wants me to lie to you. He later met with an officer to tell his story. On November 11, 1988, a detective returned to Puente's residence and, with her permission, began digging in areas that appeared to be recently disturbed. Thirty minutes later, he discovered the first body. Just hours after a body was discovered in her backyard, Puente slipped away from police. On November 13, 1988, an all-points bulletin was issued for Puente. On November 16, 1988, Charles Wilgs, along with Gene Silver of CBS, alerted police to Puente's whereabouts at a motel in Los Angeles. Wilgam met Puente, who was using the alias Donna Johansson, the day before at a nearby bar. He later recalled seeing her on a CBS morning newscast and reached out to Gene Silver, who met with Wilgus at his apartment. 
The two contacted local law enforcement and Puente was arrested the same day. Puente died in prison at Chowchilla on March 27, 2011, from natural causes. She was 82.